Welcome back to The Breakfast uh, on Plus TV Africa. A little bit of history. Let's go back to the year 2004 in Russia, where there was a very, very shocking attack by Chechen separatists on a school in Russia. They eventually held hostage more than a thousand uh, uh, kids. And, you know, this lasted for longer than could have been imagined. It eventually led to the loss of over 340 people. It was an armed gang of Chechen separatist rebels who entered a school in southern Russia and took more than a thousand people hostage. Um, it happened on the 1st of sept September and it was the day of the new school year for millions of students across Russia. Nearly 340, and this is the sad part, about half of them died in the ensuing three-day ordeal. The rebels stormed the school at 9.30 a.m. just after a ceremony celebrating the new school year uh, had ended. Um, the rebels, of course, placed children into the room um, and, of course, placed explosives at the entrances and exits to the room um, and the auditorium, school auditorium, where they were all held. Um, not long after, about, about the third day, the rebels started to shoot children. Russian special forces stormed the school and over 30 of them, of course, the Russian, uh, the Chechen separatists were killed. I think it was just one uh, that survived this attack. Um, and uh, was arrested, but all 32 of them that carried out the kidnapping and this uh, very, very dastardly act were killed when the separatists or when the Russian special forces entered the school building. Uh, this is very, very, I wouldn't say relatable, but we've had conversations like this on, you know, on the breakfast and of course across Nigeria when we've ha heard of uh, uh, people being kidnapped here in Nigeria. School children mostly being kidnapped here in Nigeria, and people have also suggested, or always suggested, you know, that there should be other ways besides negotiating and paying ransom. That there should be, you know, very, very, you know, critical ways that this could be handled. You know, can any of these sites where these uh, victims are kept be stormed? Can we have Nigeria's special forces storm any of these things? Are there tactical ways that these things can be handled? Um, but of course, we've never really been able to experience or you know, see any of those uh, yeah, play out here in Nigeria. But that's what Russia had to do. And uh, since then, I don't think we've heard anything about Chechen separatists uh, kidnapping a thousand students or kidnapping anybody uh, for ransom or for any other reason. But it happened on this day in 2004. Now let's move down here to Nigeria in 2015, where on this day, 31 workers were punished over lateness. And this happened with Governor Ayo Fayoshi in uh, Ekiti State. He basically stormed certain schools in the state um, earlier than normal. And everybody who came late to school that day was... Um, Fired. No fewer than 31 civil servants who, of course, were in various ministries, departments and agencies in the state were punished for coming back too late. Um, his visit exposed all of them, you know, because he showed up in this MDAs before 8 a.m. in an unmarked car without the usual convoy and aides, ordered the gates of the secretariat locked after him. Okay, oh, this wasn't actually in school. This was in secretariats. Um, and, of course, the unsuspecting civil servants walked into the hands of the waiting governor who kept to watch at the gate. Over 30 latecomers were apprehended by the governor and directed that disciplinary committee be set up to try them with appropriate sanctions. Um, it was, you know, a very interesting discussion in 2015 when this happened. Uh, but, um, you know, I think I have also pointed out that um, it may look like a crude way of handling issues in Nigeria, and this is what we've always, um, you know, um, pointed out. The fact that we need to have systems, we need to have better, you know, systems that operate that make it more difficult for you to break the law and more difficult for you to um, evade um, 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 uh, punishment when you break the law, when you uh, go against uh, the rules. Well, instead of having those proper and interesting systems, we then have very crude means of carrying out these things. In 2007, I believe, when um, Inugu State um, government, when uh, Chimaruke Namani finished his tenure, and of course it was taken over by Sullivan Chime, there was something that was very interesting about the way Sullivan Chime ran his government. He used to once in a while drive around town and look out for street lights that were broken, look out for traffic lights that were no longer working, look out for roads that seemed to be, you know, getting spoiled even after they were fixed. And he will call the commissioner or whoever it is whose department or whose uh, yeah, agency is meant to be handling that. He will speak with them and warn them, give them an ultimatum to ensure that it is fixed. That was him getting himself involved and getting to be hands-on with what was going on in the state. 
And if you notice between 2007 and about 2010, Enugu State changed completely. And Sullivan Chime has been praised as one of the best governors that Enugu State has ever had. So it is really, you know, I'm sharing that story because I want to encourage or I want to just point out the fact that the fact that you're a governor and you're in government house doesn't mean that you should not be able to every now and then have your hands on ground, be able to observe for yourself. Yes, you've appointed people. Yes, you've put people in these positions to handle these things. But at times when they are failing, it's just responsibility to ensure that these people don't embarrass your government because you will be blamed. A lot of people will remember who's commissioner for this or commissioner for health, commissioner for education. Nobody, so a lot of people don't even care. It is the government and the governor who gets to be blamed for some of all these things um, and the failure you know, of his government to you know, ensure a very, very um, or better society. And so I identify she may have been criticized for taking those steps because they're pretty crude, but you know, there is some sense in what he did. And this happened in 2015. Stay with us. Our first major conversation for today, we're going to be talking about the president that Nigeria needs in 2023. There have been postulations, there have been some names mentioned, there have been some people who have also mentioned that they would like to run. But what does Nigeria really need? That's what comes up next. We'll be joined by Ezekiel Nyaitok and Nick Agule, both public affairs analysts, to share with us. Stay with us.